Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Philip McDonald. I'm a Special Collections Processing Assistant, and I'm with Taylor, who's also a Special Collections Processing Assistant, and we are going to show you some amazing parts of our uh, uh, part of our uh, Special Collections that deal with uh, textiles. Um, so uh, we first want to say we collect specifically uh, textile materials that have um, some innovation significance or are related specifically to the College of Textiles. So that's where most of the stuff is why we collect it. Um, so we're going to start off in our memorabilia collection. So uh, the North Carolina University memorabilia Coll collection contains primarily objects related to the history of the university. Um, and so they don't have materials that I also say North Carolina State um, College and North Carolina College of Agriculture and Mechanical Arts will also be part of it. Um, so we'll get it started. So our first materials are right here. And so the, this is a really cool um, uh, towel samples that were developed by the textile school uh, for use in the Gemini and Apollo uh, space flights. Um, it was developed in 1965. Uh, they were supervised by Professor J.F. Bog Bogdan and William E. Moser, and the picture right here, that is Bog Professor Bogdan. Um, and though, a little bit of information, so although there are no, none, no astronauts in the Apollo program were NC State alumni, about 26 of the college's graduates were involved in the Apollo program, according to a 1969 issue of NCSU Alumni News. Um, and of course, as we all know, the Apollo missions resulted in uh, the 1969 landing on the moon. Um, and the Gemini helped uh, the Apollo missions succeed uh, in that process. So these terry cloths were first used in the Gemini um, program, and they are highly absorbent, lint free, and extremely lightweight. Um, and they were so popular, and so, and the, the astronauts obviously liked them that they were used in the Apollo as well. Um, so, yeah, we just think it's a really cool example of think and do at, and how that's always been part of the history at NC State. Um, and so these are some really cool cloths that, uh, these weren't, but things similar to it were in space, which is really awesome to think of. What's fascinating to me about these is, you know, as a student at NC State, a former student, um, <laughs> long, long time ago, um, I think I sometimes didn't really realize how NC State is truly oh. at the forefront of technology and innovation, <laughs> which is fascinating to me. I mean, we have one of the largest aerospace and mechanical engineering programs in the country, um, very involved with the space program and with NASA. Um, and I do want to plug, we have some really cool digitized collections that deal with um, NC State's history with NASA and the space program. Um, we have a oral history with a former NASA employee, which is just phenomenal. Um, so as you can see with these materials here, NC State has been involved in this sort of textile innovation with space exploration for quite a long time and continues to have, you know, that relationship with um, the space program and with um, NASA and the government. Um, so yeah, it's really, I think this is super cool. I did not know that we had these materials and Phil had mentioned it to me the other day. He's like, hey, do you know you, we have, we have some towels? <laughs> and I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? We have towels, where? And so I was just really, it's interesting to me as archivists you know, training that we can always explore new things in the archives like this. Yeah, and yeah. we have a, we have our first question in the chat, and is there anything that makes them specifically space worthy? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a great question. I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure it has to do with um, the highly absorbent and lint-free aspects of the materials. Um, just like, I'm sure they were looking for something to wick away as much moisture mm -hmm. in zero gravity as possible. I would assume that. Um, but I'm not 100% on exactly why they're uh, No, space. I, think, I think you're right. I think yeah. it's because they're highly absorbent. It, because when you're in space and you're trying to, like, retain moisture in your, in your clothing or in your towels or anything, you don't want gravity to sort of pull it away mm -hmm. from the cloth itself. So it has to be pretty absorbent. Um, 
while helping you, you know, mm-hmm. retain that moisture and get it off. So yeah, and I also think so they sweat. Yeah, and sweat. Yeah, too. A lot of they actually do sweat quite a bit in space. I've heard. So that's that's a really good question. Oh, that's a there's another. Well, it's a comment in the in the chat. It was like, I wonder what kinds of new space worthy fabric innovations are there are going around today. Mm-hmm. And I specifically, I wonder how state textiles and space engineering programs mm-hmm. are involved. I'm sure they are involved in that, but that, yeah. that's also true. That's a really good question. Right now, I'm going to put some links in the chat. The first one is, um, like Taylor mentioned, we have also a bunch of like uh, digitized materials that are related to NASA in our special collections. And so the first one is part of our digital uh, library, digitized library collections. And so if you click on that link, it'll go ahead and go through that, and then it already searches NASA for you. And then Another link is a blog post um, written by our uh, university archivist Todd and he, about um, about NC State and the Space Apollo program. So, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so and and again, how NC State was involved in the Apollo program. So that's a probably some more awesome context for these materials. Yeah. And I do want to plug one other thing. Um, we do have um, an alum at NC State, Christina Coach, I think. is It's, it's K-O-C-H. Um, she's quite involved with the International Space mm-hmm. Program as one of the first females to, um, to go out into space and to train in the International Space Program. She's come in, she has come to NC State and spoken several times. I had the pleasure of hearing her speak about her experiences training um, and the sort of rigorous training that they have to go through as astronauts. Um, so yeah, like I said, NC State awesome. has a really, really cool history with the space program that continues to this day, which is awesome. That is super awesome. Yeah. All right, so next we are going to move on to another really cool aspect of the same collection that Phil had just talked about in the memorabilia collection. Um, these here are bookmarks from the College of Textiles, formerly known as the School of Textiles at NC State. Um, so Professor Ernst B. Berry, um, a former professor in the College of Textiles, he challenged his senior students to develop these sort of really intricately designed um, yearly bookmark calendars. And if you can look really, really closely, like it goes through every part of the year and the, the intricate details are just fascinating to me to be able to to do that, I mean, I'm I was really astounded when I first saw this, and you can see in the back how many stitches it took to not only do the design at the top, but to put all of the days of the year in them. Um, and so this was actually a part of a competition with the students in the School of Textiles. Professor Barry, he challenged the students to create these every year, hmm. and because it was so fun and really sort of a challenging school task for the students, they made it in an annual event. So as you can see in our memorabilia collection, we have a wide range of dates and um, time periods represented um, going back to the 60s and on through the 80s. We have some from the 70s. And you can see, sort of see the different styles that the students went with. Some went more like NC State, some went more North Carolina design, some did different images of this is a portrait actually which is quite fascinating to me um, the level of detail that goes into doing woven portraits which we also have some of those in the memorabilia collection and there's mr wolf right there super cool <laughs> <laughs> here he is again except this one is really fascinating to me because mr wolf is actually weaving <laughs> he's using a loom there Um, and he is creating his own textiles. So the students, I think, had a lot of fun with it, which is really cool to see, look back and see, you know. um. Well, let me, the chat's blowing up a little bit over this bookmark. So um, uh, the moderator, one of our moderators actually has one. (gasps) Their dad went to NCSU, and so, oh, they got one for their birth year. That's really cool. That is such a sweet story. (laughs) See, I love that connection. That's fascinating. And you got a you got a hi Taylor. Oh hello. <laughs> from Sarah Cozy Crossing. Hello. 
thank you for joining. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really cool story. And see, that's that's one of the fascinating things to me about the memorabilia collection is it's so closely tied mm-hmm. to university history. Um, that just seeing this brings up stories and really cool histories from from the students and from those associated with the university yeah. in multiple ways. Um, so yeah, I love these. I could stare at them all day, to be honest with you. Um, but I think we highlighted some of my favorites. There's also one more I wanted to show, which has the bell tower mm. on it, of course. Um, the iconic bell tower. And I love this one. I just, I again, I can't get over how detailed they are. I mean, the trees on here surrounding <laughs> the bell tower is just so fascinating. And you can see in the back again how complex that was to sort of weave together Mm -hmm. i really think at the end of the day this is a fascinating project like a final project for a student can you imagine them all coming up with like different designs Mm -hmm. and weaving this together yeah super fun project so that is from the memorabilia collection and i think we are going to go ahead and move on to the next yes I am very excited about. <laughs> so before I do that, before you do that, I'm going to put yes. in the... No, go go ahead and grab the materials, but I'm putting in the uh, the chat a, like, history, uh, li- uh, the library create, like, kind of a history timeline of the College of Textiles. That would be super cool and yes. provide really cool mm-hmm. context to some of the materials that we are showing today. And I did want to say, going back to the, the history of the College of Textiles, another really impressive college, I would say, at NC State, I remember when I was an undergrad a lot of students I had some friends who were in the College of Textiles and the work that they were doing was so fascinating oh yeah in terms of and we'll get to this a little bit later with some of our other materials but like wearable fashion Mm -hmm. that also scans like biometrics Mm -hmm. and like a ton of really super cool things and the College of Textiles is really at the forefront of that yeah in in the nation I would say um so moving on to our next um, this is actually a collection that we have here that I'm very excited to talk about because I love fashion. Um, the William J. Heath collection of hosiery and L- lady hosiery, of course, um, and packaging. Um, to me, this is really fascinating because, well, I think it, it, in the workplace today, it's not as common to wear hosiery and it's not required, it seems like, you know, within the hosiery culture and the workplace culture of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, And as someone who did not grow up wearing hosiery, when we opened this box, I was fascinated. I was like, okay, you're selling pantyhose to ladies, right? Why a pear? Why an ice cream cone? Or (laughs) an egg? Or this one is a champagne bottle? You know, it's to me, it seems so random. But the more that I started to investigate this collection in the context of um, when pantyhose first started to become mainstream in the 60s, I was fascinated because really what this is is a, is a peek into the past mm-hmm. in terms of you know, product development and gender studies. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're selling to women, why not make every object representative at least stereotypically, of what women are interested in. So you have the champagne bottle, which is <laughs> the quote on it. It says, what, does, what it does for your legs will go to your head. Um, <laughs> right? And so for us, it's a little bit ridiculous, but this was actually what women were, were buying and were interested mm. in at the time, and that's why it's so fascinating to me. Um, and then we have the pear, And a lot of these still have the pantyhose in them, by the way. You can kind of, they're still in there. Um, The pair, again, very representative of, I think, women, women like art history. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of references to women in in fruit and pears and apples. So as a woman, just looking at it, I immediately thought, oh, that's where they're going with that. (laughs) And then the ice cream cone, again, sort of, you know, really connotating sexual imagery in my mind Mm -hmm. with women. Um, and again, with the egg, also women's reproductive systems. That's what I thought when I saw it. So for me, this was, um, it was really fascinating to look through and see. And another thing that was interesting to me is um, how exclusive, I would say, these products are. Like, mm-hmm. 
a lot of the mm. hosiery collection we have is beige or tan mm -hmm. like that's the color um and it's very clearly marketed towards women um and i think that kind of leaves out a lot of women of that time period who would mm -hmm. have been interested in wearing pantyhose or felt required to wear it to look more professional or together mm -hmm. um so you have you know people of color being excluded yes there's also size issues here because a lot of them say one size fits all i think we can all agree today that one size fits all does not usually apply to all yeah um and the other thing is is gender it's clearly marketed towards women but i think more and more today i've seen men or non-conforming individuals wearing pantyhose mm -hmm. and wanting to wear pantyhose for different reasons um so since this sort of change from the 60s of that craze of wearing these to the 90s when it sort of fell off because it wasn't required in the workplace anymore i think there's been a resurgence in hosiery mm -hmm. since then um i've at least noticed that there's like i was telling you the other day there's like an exclusive line of hosiery for menswear like men only um and it's designed to fit their bodies and it comes in multiple different colors and sizes which to me is is a really great peek into the past mm -hmm. you know and sort of seeing where we are now with fashion and in hosiery really it's so cool to me yeah it yeah. is so we got our first question about hosiery and so and it, what does exactly the hosiery guard do that is a good question so yeah i pulled out the different packages but then the other fascinating thing is all the different products that they marketed mm -hmm. towards people who were buying hosiery so i'm glad someone asked that this is Hosiery Guard by Gillette. I'm sure all of you are familiar with <laughs> Gillette, the, the, the shaving company. Um, it says, Hosiery Guard is the new cleansing bath that helps stop runs before they start. It has special ingredients to strengthen hose and prevent snagging and bagging. So basically, um, it's supposed to cleanse and strengthen your hosiery all at once. And that we actually have in this collection as well little uh, laundry bags that mm. they marketed for for hosiery that women would put in the bag and then they'd put in a cleansing bath with their hosiery guard um and we also have the run stopping here the run repair i remember growing up i was always told to use hairspray or nail pop like clear nail mm. polish to stop runs um so i was never actually aware that there were specific products mm -hmm to stop runs in your in your pantyhose I know. That, that's that that was new to me when i came across this collection awesome yeah so a lot of really cool things here i again i think this could cover so many different topics in history um so, and i just love looking at it <laughs> so speaking speaking of that i'm yes. putting a link uh to a independent uh dot co dot uk article about nylon stockings and women during the second world war uh, we initially chose this article just because the front and center picture is actually showing how vending machines were used mm -hmm. for a lot of these um, materials. Uh, but the other reason is what you brought up earlier is like how um, it's t entitled how the invention of nylon stockings helped liberate Europe and women. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you were saying, there's a lot, this is intersects with a lot of different uh, cultural histories. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, actually. That was another point that I had forgotten to mention. Um, when we found that image of the, mm -hmm. the vending machines, which I've never seen in my life with pantyhose <laughs> specifically, I was like, oh, it makes sense why they're foods. That's also true, yeah. That could you be know, part of the like imagine yeah. this like ice cream cone um, sitting in a vending or machine. Pear. Or the pear, yeah. And you're, you're thinking like, Oh, it's food. So you go, you like approach, and then you realize it's pantyhose. Maybe you buy it, you know. Or that it, they could have like a pantyhose exactly right next to a food vending machine, and it wouldn't yeah. look bad. So uh. true. So I think that's actually a really clever marketing mm -hmm. marketing technique as well to get people to draw people in. Is let's make them food shaped objects and put them in vending machines, um, especially for women on the go, mm -hmm. which is what hosiery was marketed towards. Or so. This specifically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. someone also agrees that they were also taught to use clear nail polish to so stop uh, a run in the pantyhose. Um, oh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. the, and we also learned that another use of ne a clear nail polish would help with chicker bites. Oh. Red bug bites. Um, Interesting. I've not heard that. I haven't heard that either, but I wouldn't be surprised if it worked. 
Yeah. I'm glad to know I'm not the only one about the clear nail polish. I was always taught that growing up. Okay. So, I have it right here, Phil. Is it in Dutch? Nope. Oh, that's right, that's right. Mixed this up. This my... is really exciting. Do you mind getting the block? Yeah. Together? So this is something we do with a lot of our older books just to help with their, um, help preserve them and not put too much stress on the binders. We have a lot of these different size blocks, foam blocks to help with that. Okay, so this is a um, funny story. So when we were looking for materials to uh, discuss during this Twitch, uh, Taylor kept on bringing recipes for dyeing and I didn't, it didn't click what it was, D-Y-E as in die. And so I was like very confused of like why we were looking at this. And as soon as I saw the, the folders, I was like, oh, that makes complete sense. So this is a really cool, it was donated by a, a botany professor. So it's 19th century recipes for different dye and bleached for um, materials. And what's really cool is this is kind of pre-synthetic uh, uh, dyes. So this is a lot of different like organic natural materials that kind of help um, help dye, uh, is it cotton mostly? Mm -hmm. It's mostly, mostly, cotton. mostly yeah. cotton textiles. Um, and you get also this, we, it's a great example to see what you might, what someone, a researcher might see in a special collections is you have to read handwriting. And so I think, uh, at least starting with our generation, like handwriting has become less and less important because of the amount of work we do on computers. But, um, cause I know from personal experience and research, like having to read these letters um, or, or notebooks from this, the 19th century can be very difficult and um, and and hard. Um, there's even because sometimes paper was so valuable. There's a form of <laughs> uh, letter writing which is called like crisscross, where people literally wrote horizontally and then wrote vertically on it, so um, they could. I didn't and it's, know that. Yeah, it's very no. difficult to read, <laughs> and it is a, definitely a thing. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool, um, just kind of shows the scope of what we have for uh, textiles and like this is a pre-synthetic uh, dye manufacturing. So this is a really cool mm -hmm. um, uh, recipe book. It's got about, um, let me see, 90 recipes for bleaching and dyeing clothes and other mm -hmm. materials. Um, it, the, each recipe usually starts with like the actual ingredients and then how to do it, kind of, literally like a recipe book. Um, and um, we have this quote uh, that says, from the middle of the 19th century, fashionable garments for women, which had previously been restricted largely to wealthy social classes, be uh, began to become much more widely accessible in society. Many factors contributed towards this change, including the invention of the domestic sewing machine, the growing popularity of fashion magazines, the introduction of department stores and department, uh, and development of ready-made fashions, as heralded by particularly, particularly by Charles Worth. However, an element that had an especially profound influence on the uh, democratization process was the discovery of synthetic textile dyes in their rapid industrial development, um, initiated famously by William Perkins uh, Menevy, uh, which resulted in the availability of a large, uh, wide range of bright colors for using garment uh, color coloration. Uh, mm -hmm. This paper contextualizes the influence of commercial introductions of dyes in the mid 20th century and um, so yeah, this is it's what's really, like we were saying, the context for this is just really mm -hmm. uh, cool pre-industrialization of dye manufacturing. Um, and so what was the yeah. first one that, the, and it's actually not, it's not a filled book. It's only about 33 pages are used. Um, for washing black from dye, that's what it says up there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just um, flipping through this, I was fascinated by how many different recipes there are for what is essentially the same color. <laughs> like, I never thought about that until I was flipping through this, but like, this is for brown. Do you see like olive brown, red brown? Uh, what, what brown is that? Can you read that? I don't know, I can't. So again, yeah. like I said, like you, you have to reteach re yeah. yourself cursive um, and handwriting sometimes. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many different um, variations of color that pre-synthetic dyes, mm -hmm. it was quite challenging to replicate mm -hmm. an exact tone or shade, whereas now with syn synthetic dyes, we just have to mix the right color mm -hmm. combinations to make whatever shade we want. 
So this is quite a pre- like a precise science, you know, like yeah. to get it down to the yeah. exact shade of olive brown that you would want. <laughs> um, and now or, you probably just have to press a few buttons on a computer. And oh, then... it was slate brown. Slate. Yeah. Okay. See, um, slate color blue. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is a really cool look into. We wanted to sort of give a more holistic mm-hmm. view of the history of of textiles and starting with some earlier stuff in the nineteenth century that. Um, goes back and looks a little bit back and mm-hmm. how um, technology has developed since um, with newer dyes. Um, but this, this to me is just so cool to read. And you're right, it is challenging. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is challenging to read. Um, Maybe a cool project that one of us could actually try it, depending mm-hmm. on how difficult it is to get some of the materials. This might be fun oh, to try. Oh, that... That is such a good idea. Yeah, maybe that could I be think cool. that would be really fun replicating because I well our um, university archivist Todd, he used to have I don't know if he still has it. He used to have a running blog post mm-hmm. where he would try out old recipes. That's right. That's from right. From some of our old cookbooks um, in university archives, and he would make them sometimes. Uh-huh. And they were almost always weird, <laughs> like shrimp and jello. And oh, sure, like sure, 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 Weird sure. bread recipes. <laughs> um, but yeah, that might be like a really cool thing to do to try to replicate some of these, some mm-hmm. of these um, dyes and see if we could dye cotton. That would be yeah. really cool. That's a good idea. I wonder if there's any like new like technologies for handwriting. Like we're like with translator with Google yeah. Translate app you can just put things over mm-hmm. um, a foreign language and it, it tries its best to translate it for you. I wonder yeah. if there's gonna have to be at some point something similar with handwriting yeah. just like because. an automated transcription yeah. service. I think there are things like that out yeah. there already. Um, but yeah that's that was a really good look into the past there. Yeah. I can do that. Yeah, I'll take these <laughs> someone someone really liked our suggestion about um, text, the dye maybe that's a great stream idea wink wink oh yeah I mean <laughs> that is a good we could, idea we could practice it and see if like we, you could do it live okay I am uh, you know academically personally professionally whatever you want to call it very excited about our next um, you don't next need the blocks do you items. no I okay. think so um, so before I get into showing you what the actual materials are, I'm going to give you a little context. Mm-hmm. Um, this, um, these items that we'll be talking about next are from the William Edward Shin papers. Um, Professor Shin actually created a, um, a knitted aortic valve using a machine formerly used to make men's ties in the 50s. Um, do we have the picture? Of um, them? Of the, yes. Yes. So this is Help Professor it. Shin. Um, on the left here, and then Dean Campbell. He was the dean at the, of the College of Textiles who sort of promoted um, Edward Shin developing this technology. And this, I cannot emphasize enough, was at the forefront of, of biomedical textile manufacturing and development. Um, to be able to use a knitted aorta um, successfully, they actually were able to successfully um, use his design, his knitted aorta, um, and implant it into the dean of textiles, um, the Dean Campbell's um, Dean Campbell when he had an aneurysm in the 70s. So that being said, I'm going to go ahead and show what we have. So this is the picture. This is what the valve looks like, um, completely knitted. Um, and here are the valves themselves. Um, which is so fascinating to me. Again, another thing that I did not know mm-hmm. was possible, <laughs> was, like was even possible in science, was using fabrics from a machine used to make men's ties mm-hmm. and successfully save someone's life. Yeah, that's crazy. That's, that's really fascinating to me. Um, so I think, like you had said earlier, this is a classic example <laughs> of think, think and do, do. Yeah, yeah, which I love to say, think it, this is think and do, so right here. <laughs> Um, and this was a really important contribution to the development of um, artificial aortas and, uh, you know, helping resist sort of de- deterioration within the body. And um, polyester is the material, in case anyone was interested. It was, um, they selected that as the best material for the aorta. Um, and in 1971, it, private industry began developing and using this technology. Uh, the College of Textiles and Professor Shin never formally patented this product, so 
it was sort of, um, you know, developed and used as such in the private industry um, in, for distribution all across the world, which is, is really fascinating, especially because these, this technology was made using NC State machinery mm -hmm. and at the College of Textiles expense. Um, so through that, we're able to make sort of really fascinating um, improvements in, in the medical fields um, using a machine. Um, knitting machine. So um, I just love talking about this and seeing it. Um, we also have a picture, a couple other pictures of what it looks like when it was actually implanted. We decided not to show. Yeah. It's a little graphic, um, but um, it, it's, it's, it is really fascinating to see it, um, to see it being fully implemented yeah. in that way. Um, did you have anything else? Well, I was just going to say, I just put in the chat an article written by one of our colleagues, Kathy, um, about yes. Dr. Shin, and, yeah. so, and yeah. about the aorta. So if you a little bit more context and more information yeah. in it, it will also, uh, all the links that are from our blog link to the collections themselves and to the finding, uh, the collection guide. So another way to get more information if you're interested. And um, and, and there's always a, um, why don't you put that in the chat? I'll put uh, a link to how to ask mm -hmm. to see these. Um, materials. Um, I'll do that at the end. So we, we can go to the next one. Oh, I did want to add oh, go one it. more thing. Um, in case anyone was curious, um, the use of polyester for these um, aortas was because through multiple tests and development um, phases, they figured out that polyester was the best at stretching and sort mm. of, you know, like uh, helping with circulation of blood flow um, and it didn't sort of flatten out or straighten which obviously would be very bad in, in your body um, and they were able to develop structurally with polyester the best aortic valve um, so for anyone who's really interested and like the lint question mm -hmm. with the, the towel why why was that particularly suited um, these were particularly suited for implantation because the polyester was designed for awesome. that. Awesome. Yeah, so super cool. And I'm putting the link into our chat. Um, this is our contact page, and if you're interested in viewing any of these materials, this is the avenue to do it, and I will post it again at the end of our talk. Do we need the blocks for that, do you think? Mm, no. Okay, so this, this is a little... Little, little change. So yeah. this is another notebook. Um, so this is a composition, a Dutch composition notebook, and I'm not going to try to pronounce. Um, maybe we should get the blocks. Maybe get the blocks. Yeah, okay. I would say. Okay. Why don't you grab that? Um, so this was. Um, yeah. Again, I'm I'm gonna probably butcher the name of this this textile school, but the Hoodgard Textile School. Um, in Inchdale is a well. First of all, the location of this uh, this textile school in in the Netherlands was like a textile hub for the country. So that's why it's um it's in the eastern part of the Netherlands, and it was a huge like center for production in textiles um, and the home of the textile school. So this is another example of really cool just students creating different mm -hmm. um like what do you say, weaving and crocheting, and mm -hmm. then like an example of them actually doing it. Um, this this was really interesting to me because when I first saw these, this is a great one. You can see the loops, oh, I'll yeah, move it, it the over. loops. And so you can see kind of like, it's almost like what a microscope might see when looking at some of these textiles. It's like these really uh, articulated, drawn uh -huh. loops of the actual uh, weaving. Um, when I first saw this, it reminded me of my grandfather does, did calligraphy and he would always do the borders with these like beautiful and intricate like loops and like almost, it almost looked like weaving. So it was really interesting to see this in, in, in uh, a textbook for a textile school. Mm -hmm. And I, what I love is these, these fabric samples, these are actually fabric mm -hmm. samples. So you have down here sort of the fabric samples and then like a very up close <laughs> yeah, like microscopic, a microscopic yeah. type of view mm -hmm. of, of what this looks like when it's woven together. Um, and then the same with these going up here. Um, and you can feel it, like it, it does feel, like texturally, mm -hmm. it's quite fascinating because you can sort of see little grooves. I, I think this is really cool because 
I was an English major mm-hmm. um, in undergrad. We didn't do this stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, we, I didn't have a super detailed notebook that had, oh, yeah. you know, like all yeah, these yeah, yeah. elaborate drawings. And I think another thing I never thought of is in, in the College of Textiles, they're artists mm-hmm. as well as designers and, you know, scientists in some cases. Um, because this is artistically quite challenging, at least to my amateur eye, mm-hmm. um, which I love. I mean, it's just fascinating to look and see how they learned, how they learned mm-hmm. how to create fabrics and to weave things, and even how to color, with, going back to our recipe for yeah. how to color different fabrics according that's to their another composition. Example. Yep, that's awesome. Let's see. And it's um, just kind of another example of like kind of like this is happening during the industrial like industrialization of like mm-hmm. northern Europe but like kind of how the the old oh I think I will fix that we will be right back Uh-huh. Okay, we're back. back. Sorry about that. Uh, our um, our battery died in one of our cameras. So. Slight technical difficulty. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the Dutch composition book. To me, I love this because it's fascinating to see one how other students mm-hmm. learn and you know they learn their craft and it's completely different than anything I've ever experienced as a student. Um, and I think there's a lot of creativity here that you can. I think yeah. I think you bring up like how engineering can be such a and, and textiles can be such a blend of like yeah. like right and left brain of like this mm-hmm. beautiful creativity mm-hmm. and also this like streamlined efficiency. It's really cool. Exactly. Yeah. And see, this is just I just love the fabric samples. I think. Yeah, do you both? You get to yeah. yeah. Oh, oh here's wow. some patterned ones. Those Let's are push really these. Yeah. beautiful. Let's see, yeah. Look at this one. This one's a really pretty. And that kind of reminds color. me of our 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 calendar um, bookmarks, like these like intricate yes, like. Yeah. Now You're this right. is like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, with the black mm-hmm. contrast as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. I mean, I feel like I could spend all day looking at these. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, and it's that's the one of the cool things of kind of working in an archive is it's you're almost like a time traveler sometimes mm-hmm. seeing like how a student. Uh, would work like a hundred over a hundred years ago. Um, I don't think we have an exact date on when this um, when this was created, but I believe that the that that actual area of the Netherlands is probably around the turn of the century was yeah. like when it was a an industrial hub. Um, but yeah, it's just like kind of uh, this specific this artifact is just kind of a time travel mechanism for my brain. Mm-hmm, and just like mm-hmm. I love how you how you brought up you, you being at school and just. Like how this is so different, and for me too. Like how mm-hmm. different it is uh, to to draw or sketch or to learn and to take notes. Yeah, and this for a little bit further context was made in en- Enshi- Enshide. Enshide. Yes. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're pronouncing it correctly. I don't. I, I hope that is correct. Um, but it was a city in the uh, eastern part of Netherlands, and it, that at the time that this um, this was made was a large center for production for textiles and was also home to a textile school, textile manufacturing, which this student was a part of. So um, there is quite a very rich, there is a rich history with contained within this book, just outside of the student's contribution mm-hmm. to the school, but also the school's contribution to textiles, just as NC State has left its own mark. Yeah, exactly. Textiles. Oh, yeah. That's, a, that's a great yeah, connection. Yeah. So we have a question. Can you tell us anything about the trends of textile patterns and clothing throughout the years? We cannot. I, I can. We are not the professionals. But um, but there is um, there is definitely a way to do that through special collections because we have such an abundance of materials. I will say I really do like how this, I assume this notebook is kind of like a, a jack of all trades for different weaves, a different textile like mm-hmm. mechanisms. And so it's kind of you get to see like everything that the student would try to create. 
um, or have to learn to create uh, in school. So um, I feel like the trends that we can only really speak of is like with the Industrial Revolution comes, uh, whatchamacallit, comes like mechanisms and, and less like handmade weaving and more mm -hmm. just like mass production. Also, the, um, the Industrial Revolution really made it much more... Well, one of the papers I had read about that said democratic. Mm -hmm. I saw, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't use the word democratic, um, but fashion in general became much more accessible to um, people from a variety of economic, mm -hmm. socioeconomic classes um, when the machinery sort of automated a lot of the processes yeah. that make these um, fabrics and these, these fabrics that are dyed. Um, and really... Um, the the other interesting aspect is around the turn of the 19th century, mm -hmm. as you mentioned with the recipe book. Yeah. Um, synthetic dyes and fabrics mm -hmm. are also quite popular and allow for quite a bit more, I would say, invention mm -hmm. and creativity within the field of textile manufacturing, um, which 100%. is really, really interesting. Um, all right. Would you like to move on to this? Yeah, let's do the, I think the last one is the Japanese. Yes. Okay. So this is the last, uh, I'll grab it. Last thing in our showcase. And another note, as you can see, a lot of these books um, and materials have to be housed in very specially made um, boxes that are done by our amazing preservation team. So shout out to them. Uh, yes, they for, are. They can make any box, make anything fit in any box. Yeah. It's amazing. They are also artists, just like the textile students. Yes, yes. Okay, so this is um, a collection of Japanese, Japanese fabrics. And the reason we wanted to talk about Japanese fabrics, or um, mm -hmm. in particular, was because I think it's important to recognize that a lot of fabrics and the innovation and the designs that we've talked about come from Eastern influence and specifically Japanese influence. They have a much, much longer tradition of, of manipulating and maneuvering fabrics than the United States does mm -hmm. as a country or a Western civilization in general. I mean, we're talking thousands of years of working with silks and then moving on to different types of synthetic fabrics and innovating in really fascinating ways. And um, one of the other cool things in our collections that Phil and I learned when we were researching this um, this topic was Toyota. Remember our oh, conversation yeah. about Toyota? Um, we did not realize, or at least I didn't realize, I don't know about you, that Toyota, the car company, got its start in textile manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So they were originally a um, really successful textile manufacturing company and sort of made that transition into um, cars using the machinery mm -hmm. that they had already developed for textiles. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, we have this really cool book of um, sort of, I would guess, like, what would you say, like a sample book that you would yeah. flip through, sort of like a catalog yeah, in so, a way? Yeah, so from what we were able to, so I used the, the Google translating app to like kind of put things on, like to, to try to figure out what... Uh, where this came from and so we came we came up it's from a specific company that uh fashion and design company that does like textiles and so um yeah i think this is one of their sample mm -hmm. would be like a sample book and so mm -hmm. and this when i first saw this i thought this was also like real fur it's not it's completely synthetic um by uh yeah fuzzy very I wish fuzzy. Can, yeah it is very fuzzy yeah, <laughs> I got I a little this, distracted I wish it, yeah <laughs> <laughs> it is so soft yeah, we were interested in whether or not it was real fur, but how did, did, did it say Yeah, it says label. down here, it said synthetic. Yeah, there are labels on all of these, and this is a book of 52 samples. It's actually in a series. Series of, of it's a, yeah. It's volume one of multiple that this company made to uh, sort of catalog different fabric mm -hmm. uh, fabric types. And I think it's really, it's really cool to look through and see the different, yeah, the textures are what's fascinating yeah. to me. I wish we had like a way of, Remote technology is not that advanced yet, yeah. but if y'all could feel this, that would be super Maybe cool. in the future when we can all be in the same room together, we could do a yeah. show, 
show and tell with some of the stuff, but yeah. And the colors are really vibrant to yeah. me as well, which is what's fascinating, you know, especially thinking back to our Recipe for Dying book, like, what would they call this, like, very bright red with purple Probably. mixed in, you know? Or like, like, with, like, magenta, like, yeah, yeah. we would just call it magenta, but... <laughs> right, like, these are obviously more synthetic fabrics. This would be, fabrics. like, an olive green or yeah. dark brown green. Yeah, exactly. Definitely saw an olive green in the recipe book. So it looks really good. Like, very clear and crisp. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is what you would find maybe at a department store. Just like when I used to go to like department stores when I was a kid and my mom would get uh -huh. uh, a little design Design on this and one. stuff yeah. and get like different types of uh, I materials. I think, yeah, and one of the other things, <laughs> you just said that and that reminded me. My mom got like a new couch a couple years ago, uh -huh. and they pulled out a book just like this. <laughs> oh, at, like, sure, yeah. At, like Ashley Home Furniture or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And she was flipping through, feeling it just like we are, and that's how she sort of figured yeah. out which um, which fabric she was going to put on her couches. And I think that's sort of the applications of, of a catalog of fabrics like this is you can, you know, go through, feel, mm -hmm. touch, look, all that mm -hmm. stuff, and then figure out what you would want to put it mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, or how many, how much of it you want. Yeah, maybe exactly. Or even if you clothes. wanted to mix fabrics, yeah. you know, potentially. That's really cool. That's a cool idea as well. Um, so these are just so beautiful to me. And I love, thinking back to that Dutch composition book, mm -hmm. can you see how... Yeah, 100%. You can sort of see the different weavings within, mm -hmm. this, within this specific sample. That one's really cool as well. Yeah, so like I said, we have a couple of these. There's more um, There's more of these volumes of fabric samples in our collections. Oh, this one is what interesting. Is I don't know. Hmm. It almost feels like... Like a fake leather? Or leather. Pleather, pleather. Yeah, it yeah, feels yeah. like leather. Maybe that's <laughs> why it was sticking to the back of the other Maybe. Paper. Yeah, so a lot of different... Oh, we have a, quite a bit of range in here as well, like... For someone who's shopping for fabrics or looking <laughs> to use a fabric in some regard, they Ooh. really gave us quite a variety. Oh, there's like suede. It's like an artificial suede, probably. Yeah, that one's suede. That feels really good, too. That's really... That's beautiful. Yeah. Is that another, like, suede-esque? It is suede, kind of cool. yeah. So that, yeah, this was the kind of the last, right? This is the last thing we mm -hmm. had to mm -hmm. show. Um, Thank you for all the love on um, on the uh, on the chat. Oh, we do have a question. Does yeah. NC State Archive have any fabric sewing patterns? Oh, I Todd would know. I don't yes. know if they do. If you have any questions, I'll put we the do. Can you put the? I'll put the contact in again. That's a great have, question. Uh, we can give out our contact information because we do have a lot of specialists within our department. That's the one thing I say about like working in the archives is we know a little bit about a lot yeah we're not like we're, we don't know like a ton about everything but we but also know people that yeah do. but we know the people we can put you into contact with so put our emails in if someone do you want to put our emails in yes yeah okay um so if you um would like to reach out to special collections we are by appointment only at the moment but you're more than welcome to look at any of the materials that we've showcased today or any of the collections we've referenced um this is really this is something we were reflecting on when we were um, putting all this together is that there's such a fascinating collection of textile materials in um, special, the special collections department that we did not realize ourselves until we started to dig through some of the histories um, and see what we could find. And I think we came up with a really fascinating collection of materials, but there's so much more too. So fortunately, we only had an hour. We could have talked all day about this, I'm yes, sure. Yes, definitely. And we um, got and we got a chat from Virginia, one of our colleagues, about it, mm -hmm. where she says that they probably have some in the home demonstration collection. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. We have a lot of extension materials as well yeah. through the university, um, ag extension and home extension stuff. I think that's maybe what Virginia is referencing. Um, so, yeah, that's a good question. I know we do have other fabric samples, um, but I'm not so sure about the, the patterns. Oh, I'm so happy that uh, one of the moderators plugged our um, makerspace. Yes. And a lot of people don't think of makerspaces mm -hmm. as having sewing machines, but that is 100% making. Yes. And and, I, and I, that's such a, a, mm -hmm. a really amazing aspect of makerspaces that they have sewing machines and, and crickets to do different um, 
just different uh, mm-hmm. fashion or clothing things. And uh, back to what you were saying about kind of like wearable fashion, a lot of that you can also like mm-hmm. do different kind of like emerging technologies with like um, circuit mm-hmm. uh, circuit expresses from Adia Fruit, which we also have in the makerspace if people want to check those out and play with them. But you can do a lot of cool stuff with technology and fashion. So yeah, the makerspace is, our makerspace is amazing here. Yeah. I've used, I personally have used it yes. a bunch. Um, and so that is actually a great plug. Well, you've made you've made stuff with our three D printers, mm-hmm. right? Like wearable. You made earrings. Oh, I did. No, I used the laser printer, or I used the uh, the laser cutter. I made um, uh, <laughs> I made some ornaments and I made some earrings. Wow. See, by just cutting it yeah, out. Yeah, there's a lot you, you can, can do. Yeah, yeah there's that a, was lot a lot you of can fun. Do. I know we have a sewing machine. We also at the in the makerspace. There's also um, isn't there some sort of sort of like e textile? I think it's like a cricket digital Do, embroidery. Oh, that's a cricket. I think that the cricket uh, machine is like yeah, but you're exactly right. It does like you can do like di- like it will make embroider what you put yes, into it yeah yes yeah so definitely check out the makerspace there's a lot great connection there. moderator mm-hmm. love it and um i did want to say thank you to everyone who helped put this together yes. um claire with the fellows um the fellows program she was great at getting this all set up for us this all this techie stuff um <laughs> i did want to thank everyone at scrc for helping us put this together you know it took a lot to get all of these materials sent from their various locations here, so I'd like to thank everyone who had a part in that. Especially Clara. Clara was a yeah. big part in coordinating it, and um, also Todd for yes. uh, literally taking stuff out of the vault and yeah. saying that, thinking this would be cool for us to use. I know he gave us the, the Dutch notebook, right? Yes, yes. He specifically yeah. pointed that out. So, mm-hmm. yeah, huge yeah. thank you. So, thank you to everyone, and I hope you enjoyed. If you have any final questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Otherwise, we are going to... We are going to log off. Um, Like I said, I'll end it again with our contact information. Um, Oh, sorry. Let me put a link to our contact for special collections. Yeah, Um, if you you ever have any questions or are interested in viewing our materials, feel free to reach out. So this is our contact information. And actually, I'll also link our, just our, the intro to our special collections where you can start looking at our guides and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Which is super cool. Let me find that. Our right. digital collections, I should also plug them. They are fantastic. We yeah. have a lot of materials digitized. A lot of university history certainly is up there as well. Yeah. I had, I just put the, our digital collections into um, into the chat. And then here's, uh, here's our home page for Special Collections Research Center, which you can start searching our collection guides pretty easily. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you for, for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everybody that came and, and listened for, hung out for a little bit. Um, again, please feel free to contact us. This was a lot of fun, and I mm-hmm. hope everyone has a good weekend. Bye.